Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Are we heading towards utopia or dystopia? Today's most popular science fiction says we're headed for collapse, the sort seen in The Walking Dead or Terminator. But today's guests have a more positive view. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, we talk with Jacobin writer Peter Fraze and musician Boots Riley about the better worlds they say are possible. All that and a few words from me on Cheney and his vacation homes. It's all coming up. Stay tuned. Should technology make us feel hope or fear? Those who fear say the horse thought its future was secure too before the car. What will workers do in an age of touchscreen cash registers and drive themselves taxis? Our next guest sticks to the optimistic view. With more tech tools, there's more leisure in our future, as there should be, he said. He's also convinced that capitalism will end. Peter Fraze is an editor of Jacobin magazine and has a book coming out next year from Verso. It's called Four Futures. Peter, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Great to be here, Laura. Now, you say that technology isn't so much a thing as a social relation. I mean, somebody does have to make this thing, yes. but it's the social relations behind it that are the important factor. Exactly. So that, right, that phone made probably in a factory in China. By, you know, a few years ago, we saw the stories of the horrible labor conditions of the workers for Foxconn, the company that makes those phones. They were committing suicide. They were organizing. They were rising up. And one of the... You know, one of the reasons that that came about in the first place is because, you know, with China entering into the capitalist world, you had this enormous influx of cheap labor that essentially made it so that workers were cheaper than machines. Mm -hmm. They were more that you could basically treat work, human beings as though they weren't human beings. And but once those workers started to rise up and also once the labor market became tighter in China, one of the first comments the owner of Foxconn said is, well, I'm going to look into robots to do this stuff. So it's not just here, it's not just in the rich countries, but even in places like China that you see that that, that persistent struggle where, where you know, workers struggle to get higher wages, better working conditions, more control over their work, but the people who actually own the property, who control the wealth and who control the production process respond to that by saying, well, how can I cut the workers mm. out of this process? And you say that's actually what was going on with the Luddites, um, going yes. back to that group who are always raised whenever anyone criticizes new technology. Oh, you're just a Luddite. Not quite so simple as you say. No, because people raise that as though the Luddites were somehow like ideologically against progress or against technology. I mean, these were people at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution yes, in Europe. Yes, the early Industrial UK. Revolution who were, did smash machines, the sort of, the, you know, the, these sort of like weavers and people who, you know, saw like new technologies that were being used by the bosses essentially to control them. And they did sometimes use smashing machines as a way of having leverage over the boss. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't because they were against technology or they were against, you know, the forward motion of increasing our social wealth. It was because that was how they could make the boss pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. and, they, and so they didn't limit themselves to smashing just the machines in the workplace. They would go and smash up the personal mm. property of the boss because that was, I mean, it was just a part of the overall strategy of labor, labor struggle to improve their position mm. as workers. So if it's all about social relations and the position and the relationships between labor and owners, um, what's the future? I mean, you, you talk about four futures. The folks over at the Atlantic magazine who quoted you not so long ago talked about, I think it was three futures. Um, what are the possible options that we're facing as far as you're concerned? I think, so for futures, that spins out from a, some, from a couple of different dimensions. So I'm sort of starting from the standpoint, as I've sort of just said, that it's, suppose this possible for us to mm -hmm. automate you know, if we're doing a thought experiment, suppose we could automate everything. Okay. Suppose we didn't need any human labor. Okay. Then what? You know, and there's a certain style of liberal futurist that says, well, great, we'll be the Jetsons and it'll be, you know, we'll, we'll just all like have great lives and it'll be post-scarcity and whatever. My view is that, that we only get there through a political struggle because we remain in a society where property and political power and wealth is controlled by a small elite that wants to preserve that power and will want to continue to preserve it 
whether or not human labor in mass is necessary or not. Mm -hmm. And so the big struggle going forward is, is our social wealth shared out equally or is it not? Mm -hmm. And so one aspect of that is that in order to preserve their power and their wealth, the elite often promotes kinds of work that are not necessary in the sense of improving our lives or our social welfare, but that are necessary in terms of preserving wealth and power. And so I talk about intellectual property as a way in which that's done, creating claims over things that are essentially free to reproduce, but by controlling the copying of music files, say, you are preserving somebody's claim on wealth. And that that's a way that you sort of, and then you people have to work to earn money to buy things that don't cost anything to reproduce. Mm -hmm. That's one way in which that's done. And the other aspect of this that I discussed that intersects with all of these questions is the ecological crisis, the climate crisis, that climate change, resource scarcity, you know, water scarcity, all of these things that are very much happening now raise this question of even if in principle we have the technology to produce an arbitrarily high standard of living for everyone, maybe we don't, maybe this, the earth for this moment can't sustain that. And if it can't, is, the, is there going to be a sort of a, a shared sacrifice, a shared sort of rationing of what, of what we can do? Or are the rich going to lock themselves away in their sort of green enclaves with their robots and leave everybody else to rot? Mm -hmm. Which is a very dangerous scenario in a situation where they don't actually need huge numbers of workers to produce the goods. And the questions become about ecological scarcity rather than about the need for labor. Mm. So what are the kinds of things that we could usefully, or that people who are concerned about this could usefully fight around? Because labor power is being undermined daily by new technology, amongst other things. Um, there are an ever growing number of people in that pool of um, reserve labor that can mm -hmm. be called in to undermine bargaining power at any moment. That seems like that's only going to grow. What gives us the political oomph and, and what can we organize around if we want to try to change some of these relations that you're talking about? I mean, it's a, it's a good question and I certainly don't pretend that I have all the answers to it or I'd be doing something more important than editing a socialist magazine. But I think it's a battle that proceeds on multiple fronts. And so I think that, for example, in the, to the extent that we see new kinds of labor struggles arising, like the fast food workers, the fight for 15 workers demanding a higher minimum wage in the low wage sectors, that's important and it's important in a way that goes beyond just the fact that it would be better for people to make a higher wage. Mm -hmm. it, it's an attempt to break us out of a situation where in some ways the problem is not that we have too many robots, but too few. You know, often the response you get sometimes when the response from the right or from the employer to something like a Fight for 15 campaign is, well, if these wages get too high, we'll just replace these workers with robots. You know, there's a company that actually makes a machine that does all the hamburger flipping and everything. And the response to that, I think, has to be, well, in the long run, that's not so bad. You know, that's better than being stuck in a situation where we feel the only option, the only way for people to survive is to be stuck in these crappy minimum wage jobs. Well, it's not so bad if your family aren't going to starve and you're not going to lose your well, house. Well, and that's the question, is then that's why we have to, it has, there has to be multiple fronts of like, we have to look at a larger scale of how to make sure everyone can achieve a basic standard of living. Everyone has the ability to live mm. and not have that tied necessarily to wage labor, to jobs in the way that it has been in a lot of the recent history of the liberal left. All right, so you can have your technology, Mr. Employer. If we get to deconnect our, our health insurance, our health service, our health coverage mm -hmm. from our job, if we get to have a guaranteed minimum income, and if we get, I don't know, free education. That's right. A guaranteed housing. That's right. But I'm still asking, where is the political power going to come from to be able to fight for any of those things? I think it comes from where it always comes from, which is the capacity of masses of people to disrupt, which I think we do still have. That which we should does do quick before exist. the robots take over. I mean, it, does, I mean, it is, I mean, I, I do think that is it, the thing that is scary and dangerous is to the extent that we are in a world where the rich can really just hide in their fortresses and send out the drones to keep order. Mm -hmm. It does become harder, but I don't think we live in that world mm. right now. I do no, think, you think capitalism's going to end. Yeah, I think, yes, which doesn't mean that I think that, you know, exploitative hierarchical social structures are going to end. I just think that what we have thought of as capitalism based primarily on the exploitation of wage labor 
to make profit is going to turn into something else. You know, I quote in the book, you know, Rosa Luxemburg, famous phrase, you know, we face a choice between socialism or barbarism. Mm -hmm. And the book is in a certain way of working out of that idea. Mm. Like, what, is, what does socialism mean in the 21st century? What does barbarism mm. mean in the 21st century? And those are the, some mm. of the ideas I'm trying to explore. So where do you see, do you see examples, um, I don't know, grass, green shoots uh, of, a new, of a new system out there? I, I do, to some extent. We, we try to cover them on this show. Yeah, I mean, it ranges, I mean, in terms, on a political level, it's these new labor movements, it's things Occupy and all the things that came out of Occupy that have continued to grow and develop out of that. It's, you know, worker cooperatives, it's various other kinds of, you know, ways in which people, you know, whether it's, you know, open source projects or other kinds of collaborative, you know, not money-mediated kinds of projects. That stuff is all around. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not... I'm not enough of an anarchist to think that that stuff sort of will just make the new society on its own without a kind of, you know, a pitched battle and a real direct break and a struggle at the level of the state. But the makings of that new world are all around. I think that's definitely true. And I think that, you know, there's no kind of reform or revolution opposition that we need to make here. The more that we make it possible, that we win reforms that allow people to have more time, to have more money, have more security in their health care, in their education, to be able to pursue new ways of living, new ways of organizing. There are so many people that want to do that, and the more that they have the opportunity to do it, the more we're going to see mm. people figure out the, the elements of that new world. And it may be the more they have the necessity to do that, they That's find true them in too. a situation where they That's true, that too. Out. I mean, we're going to see, especially you know, in places like Greece, we're going to see people of necessity creating these new forms. Um, and, yeah, sometimes that, yeah, sometimes that can also be the, the, you know, the, the basis of something that people hadn't imagined was possible before. Peter, thank you so much for coming, and we look forward to your book coming out for Futures. Sign up for our mailing list, and we'll keep you up to date for when the book comes out. Thanks a lot. Great. Thanks for having me. Continuing the conversation about the future and social change, I had a chance to speak recently with lyricist, MC, screenwriter, and organizer Boots Riley, frontman of the Oakland-based hip-hop group The Coup, and author of a brand new book, Tell Homeland Security We Are The Bomb. This is part two of my interview with Boots. You can find part one at our website. So is there anybody in the 2016 political no. scene that turns you on? No. Nope. It's not about, it's not, it's not, not, not in the 2012 scene or 2008 <laughs> scene, 2004, none of that. So and the, the, the reason is, is that power comes from the folks with the wealth. It comes, it comes from the corporations and that's who controls the politicians. If you can have a movement that is able to stop profit even on a reform level, you can, you can force things to happen. You can force the folks with, you can go past the puppets to the puppet masters and make them make the puppets dance however you want them to. So if we have a, a, a mass movement that is able to use withholding of labor as a tool, we can make anyone do anything. I mean, affirmative action came in under Nixon. It's not because he was totally fascist right here, but just around this one thing, he was pretty progressive. No, it's because there, were, there was a movement building that they were scared of turning even more radical. And they we got the New Deal, because there was the Communist Party that you talked about that posed a real threat. It's been a blow, because they got the TV, we got the truth. They own the judges, and we got the proof. We got hella people, they got helicopters, they got the bombs, and we got the, we got the, we got the kids here. What happened in those what have become now red states? You talked about Alabama, um, Utah. Uh, you go to Appalachia today, there's plenty of radical people in terms of people fired up about how corporations are using their land and their labor. Um, but there's not a whole lot of organizing. Well, there's some. But the national organizations don't seem to have much of a presence there. Well, there's only 7% of folks that are involved in, uh, in the U.S. that are involved in unions. Right. And a lot of that is because the tactics of those unions, when the radicals all left them, right. 
and the, the, the laws, the Taft-Hartley laws, don't allow for uh, sympathy strikes. They don't allow for, uh, for, for multi-sites to be striking against one corporation or, um, or anything like that. And those are the, that's what's going to be necessary to win. And I think people are looking for, the reason why there's not a lot of organizing is that people are looking for ways uh, for movements to work. So they don't want to get involved in something that they don't think is going to win. I mean, similarly, I mean, you can even look at that with voting. Like, people are like, oh, I'm not going to vote for that person because they're not going to win. With campaigns and, and struggles, it's like that. We got to give them something that they think is has at least the logical ability to win. And a lot of times we, we aren't doing that. I just fit the dope lines. I don't snort them. Tell the boss to call police to escort them. You don't write out them lies, you just quote them. Get offline, plug into this modem. No, you can't outvote them. The rules are still golden. Only jewels we holdin's if we guard our scroll them. If you press the ear to the turf that is stolen, you can hear the sound of limitations exploding. I find it profoundly sad with the com when the confrontation between Bernie Sanders and Black Lives Matter happened. And the Bernie team, it seemed to me, not being there, seemed to be so inept at responding. Um, to a critique around race. And I felt, wow, I thought we'd actually come further in connecting our economic justice analysis and our racial justice analysis. I guess we have a whole lot of work left to do, but I'm assuming you were looking at that situation and the confrontation with Hillary Clinton too and had some thoughts? Well, I mean, what my goal is to do with my art is to help build a movement uh, a, that can that build a mass movement that can use withholding of labor as as a strategy for social change. I think that elections are a dead end, and it's not just a slogan. You know, we've we've seen it in recent history. We've seen it along recent history. We had a big anti-war movement against the in the early 2000s against the Iraq War, and um, that turned into a pro-carry movement. As soon as the election was over, that was done. Built up again, uh, an anti-war movement that turned into a pro-Obama movement. Uh, and, and even though that was like, there were so many grassroots folks involved and they were like talking about the networks, they did, they had massive networks made. But what it is, is that what you're telling people is that this guy is a game changer. And what we're doing is we're not really being honest with people when we say that. And because that's the only way you're going to get people to come to vote is if you if if they think so. the reason that people don't vote is because they know that it doesn't it's not a personality contest it doesn't matter who's in office you could elect Che Guevara you know the president has a function and that function is to work for the ruling class so how do we affect change because some people are like well if you're saying we don't vote then what do we do but we have taking our energy away from organizing at the workplace, from radicals organizing at the workplace, and put it into voting for this candidate and voting for that candidate. And it's, and it, and it makes sense because since the left has only put up like, well, we, we can get out on the street and let people know we don't like it and our voices will be heard and those in power will be scared of our voices. That's the same that's the same, instead of saying, well, this is right. part of the step until we can organize in the workplace and we can stock profit. Instead of saying that, that's what we're saying is let your voice be heard. So voting is letting your voice be heard. So, of course, it, it seems interchangeable. We're really giving an incorrect analysis of how power works when we tell people that voting for the... Because, yeah, there are... I'm not, I'm not going to be naive and say that there aren't differences in candidates. There are differences and there's a small little wiggle room that happens. But that wiggle room is f that, that you can get from that, the couple things you can get, is far outweighed by the decimation of mass movements that happen when any election comes around. It's like a hot wild baby when we put it together. When the sparks fly, will ignite the future forever. This is the last kiss Martin never gave a Coretta. It's like a paparazzi picture when I flash my Beretta. I got scars on my back, the truth on my tongue. I had the money in my hand when that alarm got wrong. We wanna be fighting freedom from our lawns to homeland.
so good that we are the bomb. Right. Your work is, as you just said, is about creating fertile ground for organizing. You've also talked about imagination and the importance of imagining um, movements that maybe don't exist yet, a lot of what you did in the coup. Uh, you have a line, this will be the year that we've been waiting for. It, will this be the year we've been waiting for? Which year will be the year we've been waiting for? And what do you see as the role of that aspiring, that kind of manufacturer of Vision. Every year that we take action and move ourselves more towards that goal, every year that we um, that that we identify the the point of conflict in capitalism, which is exploitation, and work around getting people to organize around that in a radical way, with the idea of not just putting food on the table, but also working to change the whole system, to get rid of this system and put in place a system where the people democratically control the wealth that we create with our labor. Every year that we do that, that is this year. This year will be the year that we do what we've been waiting for. This year will be the year that we stop knocking and kick down that door. And that's what that song says on this year. You know, it, it's a process, but I think as we've seen, there's a quantitative to qualitative leap. Like, I didn't, a lot of people didn't see Occupy movement blowing up into that. Black Lives Matter has blown up. Uh, there's a lot of things that can happen when there's a concerted effort in a certain way, and tremendous leaps can, can happen. And I think it's time to combine a lot of these ideas and, and move forward with that. That was beautiful, Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It was really fun. Thanks for having me. It's gonna be ending with us winning. You already know. This time we get it in. Go get them off their body, baby. This time we go bust the ceiling. Oh, 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 for sure. We're coming with tens of millions. Them feelings be oh so shady. It's gonna be ending with us winning. You already know. That was part two of my interview with Boots Riley. For more information about his book tour and his book, Tell Homeland Security, We're the Bomb, visit our website. Waterfront sunsets, oysters, cool breezes on white sails. I hope the Bushes and the Cheneys enjoyed their long vacation because now it's time for them to hand over their vacation homes to refugees. I know you didn't think your war would touch your mansions, but as Donald Rumsfeld once said, stuff happens. Plenty of people knew the invasion and occupation of Iraq would break a region and unleash a nightmare. From a thousand cruise missiles and $18 billion in arms sales, what did you think would come? What's coming, says the United Nations, is at least 850,000 people fleeing war in Syria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, and sub-Saharan Africa. They'd rather be home too. You bear responsibility, and you have the room. The Bush family already had two mansions in Kennebunkport. Governor Jeb just bought a third. Mr. Rumsfeld and Cheney enjoy private resorts on the Chesapeake Bay. It's time they gave up their private decks and rolling lawns. Iraqi women freeing ISIS would enjoy Rumsfeld's manor house. It may be on Mount Misery, but they know the real thing. And the Cheneys could house a village or two at their ranch in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. They'd just need to hold their GOP fundraisers elsewhere this year. In truth, though, it's not just them. This is our world, too. Lots of Americans watched the desperate wash up dead from the comfort of second homes this month. Last year saw a 57% increase in vacation home buying in the States, according to the National Association of Realtors. The number of second homes has risen 25% since 1989 to some 5.1 million properties. Today, we hardly use them. Almost half of us take no time off. So how about it? Let's hand them over. Mine sleeps too. We can squeeze in more. I will, if the bushes will. How about you?